And now we're recording. Welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for September 24th, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the CI Trust Framework with Dave Kelsey. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, the presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the presentation using the chat box. So um, if you hover your uh, pointer over the application and you'll see you type questions here, I just put, put in a little message there so you could see that. So uh, feel free to ask questions during the presentation, but we will also leave time at the end of the presentation for questions. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Dave. Dave, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, can I just check that the audio is fine? Yep, you sound great. Okay, thank you. So good morning to everybody in uh, North America. Good afternoon to those of you in Europe. And if you're somewhere else in the world, whatever the appropriate greeting is, greetings. So, and I would also like to thank uh, Jeanette and Trusted CI for inviting me to, uh, to talk about the SCI Trust Framework. So it's, uh, it's nice to have this opportunity. So I've got a fairly large number of slides here, some of which I will go through fairly quickly. Um, they're there for sort of completeness with the, uh, for people to look at afterwards and we'll, we'll see how, how it goes and what particular interest there is in various topics. Um, so just a couple of words about me. For those of you who don't know me, um, my day job is I'm head of particle physics computing at um, Rutherford Appleton Lab in the UK, STFC UK Research and Innovation. But for the last uh, nearly 20 years, I've had various roles in security, trust and identity, um, together with many of you, the attendees uh, um, at this, uh, this webinar as well. Um, so specifically because of my particle physics uh, role, it's the Worldwide Large Hadron Collider Computing Grid at CERN, WLCG, and GridPP, the particle physics infrastructure in the UK. Um, but we've also been um, able to benefit from having funding from the European Commission on various projects that's enabled us to actually standardize out what we're doing beyond just particle physics, but also for other communities. So right at the start, I started with the, UA, uh, the EU CA coordination group, which in the fullness of time became EU Group PMA and led to the formation of the Interoperable Grid Trust Federation. I'm actually speaking here at a meeting at the end of a day of meeting of the EU Group PMA. So I'm surrounded here in the room by various colleagues from EU Group PMA. But then also the Joint Security Policy Group. Um, later, I then uh, became active in fim r the Research Community Federated Identity Management Requirements. And then that turned into, all of those activities turned into SCI and WISE, which I will talk about more. So the contents of this uh, webinar, I will uh, go through the list that you see there. I don't tend to, to read it all out. Um, There'll be, as you've heard, uh, opportunity to ask uh, questions and have discussion afterwards. However, before I start, I think it's worth um, just saying a few words about the word infrastructure, because that seems to mean different things um, both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, as I understand it in uh, the USA, the federal funders of research have defined this term cyber infrastructure, and this has now been well, well used and uh, people are used to that. In Europe, we tend to call this e-infrastructure, although sometimes we call it cyber infrastructure as well, which makes things confusing. But we also have the concept of research infrastructures, which is an infrastructure of, um, uh, specific to one community or a small group of communities. And in many ways, the SCI, Security for Collaborating Infrastructures, includes all of these. Um, so the definition in the SCI document of infrastructure is all of the IT hardware, software, networks, data, et cetera, et cetera, required to develop, test, deliver, monitor, control, and importantly, to support services. And it's then that that infrastructure, that collection of um, components together with its management and its resource providers and service operators that provide and manage and operate all of the services required by the 
resource prov providers and importantly the user communities their collection of users and historically SEI has involved a fairly large number of infrastructures EGI EU DAT Geant um, the network in Europe Prace WLCG Exceed the Human Brain Project Group PP Open Science Grid etc so I'll st start by saying a few words about background and history of how we all got started and what the aims were and then go on to the latest version of the trust framework. So it's well known, I think, that research infrastructures working together share threats and share users. The infrastructures are subject to many of the same threats. Um, because of shared lots of things, shared technology, shared middleware, applications, and shared users. And user communities tend to, particularly if they are global in scope, often use multiple e-infrastructures, often using their same, ideally using their same federated identity credentials. So security incidents tend to often spread by following the user, for example, via compromised credentials. and. Um, so several e-infrastructures have been talking to each other for quite some time and the security teams have decided a long time ago it would be nice we should collaborate because we need to work together. This slide, next slide on the standards-based approach security risk management, I mean this is well known, there are lots of uh, such uh, um, standards defined by NIST, by ISO, etc. Um, and it's the usual thing of defining your, doing a, a register of your assets, um, determining the threats and the risk to those, coming up with a security plan to mitigate those risks. And the security plan includes various controls, which can be technical, operational management, and security policy is part of the management controls. So security policy and the trust framework is just one control we have as technical um, security people to uh, to improve and manage the the risks to mitigate the risks um, and use of a standard policy framework can be used to build trust between infrastructures and allow interoperation and sharing of user communities so way back in the early 2000s we were working in WLCG and EGE on security policy and we decided then to work together um, through WLCG, Open Science Grid then became very active as well. So we had a transatlantic um, cooperate, uh, cooperation there. And one of the great successes of that was we agreed a common version of a, a simple grid acceptable use policy. And we'll come back to that later. That was subsequently used by many infrastructures and indeed then modified by many infrastructures, which is part of the problem we're now trying to address again to try and reunify and simplify the uh, the AUP. Uh, in its activities, JSPG, the Joint Security Policy Group, defined many other policies, um, but today, even today, we've managed to persuade the management of EGI and WLCG in general to still use the same, same identical security policies. But it became obvious as time went on that it was often not easy to agree on identical policy words and in fact, it was not necessarily the best way of doing it. So we wanted to step up a level, needed a better way of um, trusting each other and agreeing policy between each other. So this is where SCI came um, into being. So Security for Collaborating Infrastructures, SCI, uh, started as a very much as a grounds up uh, approach. It was the security teams talking to each other, saying, what do we need to do to trust each other to actually handle security incidents um, to, to enable our users to interoperate, to make sure that we've got traceability, etc. Um, and so this grew out of the work that I've already talked about in JSPG and many of the colleagues, we um, were also involved in the IGTF activities. And so it became quite natural that, so that the various security experts um, decided to, they often met and then um, decided to work together. And what we decided at that point was it would be good to have a trust framework to enable interoperation of the security teams to manage cross infrastructure security risks and to develop 
policy, what's called security policy words. And this came to fruition in 2013 when uh, we published what was version one of the SCI document. It was published in the ISGC 2013 conference proceedings and the link is there. And that document defined a series of numbered requirements in six areas. So now I move forward a little bit to uh, 2015 and the start of the WISE community where SCI was one of the two founding communities that together with the Terrena be became Giant's um, special interest group in information security management. Uh, common uh, problems, common areas where we could work together and indeed we decided we would and that's what then became known as the WISE community. Um, WISE community is WISE information security for e-infrastructures. And the short history is it started in October 2015 with this common meeting. It was a workshop. Hey, uh, David. Meeting. Uh, David, uh, pardon in the Barcelona interruption. In David, can you hear me? Community members come from. Yes. Uh, pardon the interruption. Uh, your audio is uh, cutting uh, in and out. I can. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, let's. Now as well. Yes, I can hear you. In that. Uh, am I cutting in and out to you too? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. Ah, that's not good. Your audio is cutting in and out. So one of, one of the problems I have is that we we are hosted here at a. <laughs> An, an institute and I, that we, we have no direct control of the network at the moment. It's been okay during the whole of the afternoon. But how is the audio it's now? A, it's, a, it's better. So uh, let's, let's try to continue. So maybe I'll try and speak slowly and simple short sentences. <laughs> yes, for us, for us to understand. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. So why started in October 2015? Um, it's governed by a steering committee. We have good technical support and project management by the Géant staff. And the real work is done in various working groups. It's not the, the topic of, of this webinar to go through the various working groups, but one of them is SCI. We try to meet face-to-face -face at least twice a year, once in North America and once in Europe. You'll see we met with the Cybersecurity Summit, NSF, in August of last year and in August of this year. And then we had two meetings in Europe. Um, at, uh, hosted, I hosted one in uh, SDFC in Abingdon. And then there was a, a birds of a feather session at the TNC 17 conference in the, that should say TNC 18, I realized, Trondheim conference in June 2018. Here are some three uh, group photographs of the opening meeting in Barcelona, Spain, the meeting we had in February this year in Abingdon, and the most recent um, WISE meeting on the day before the, during the training day of the NSF um, Cybersecurity Summit this year in August. Just to see if you recognize various people. So I think at this point it's worth pointing out that SCI has already reached adulthood and has had two children so far. SCI version one has two children. Um, both are separative, separate derivatives of the SCI version one trust framework. One is Certify, which people have probably heard of, Security Incident Response Trust Framework for Federated Identity, now owned by RefEDS. And the other one is Sanctify, produced by the ARC projects and being taken forward now under IGTF. And this is scalable policy for research services behind an SP IDP proxy. There are links to the two documents there. Here's the picture of the uh, Certify paper, um, December 2015, and the Sanctify was published in uh, early 2017. So, why did we produce then a SCI version two? Um, we wanted to 
involve a wider range of stakeholders. Up until now, it had just been the, the various infrastructures. We wanted more of the network, so Géant, the European network. We wanted the, the various national research networks, the NRENs, and also potentially identity federations. As we were bringing in new uh, participants, we wanted to address any conflicts in version one for the new stakeholders and then go through in detail the documents, the version one document and add new topics and areas if needed and indeed remove topics, which we did. We removed one of the, one of the topic, topics from version one. And this is always the case where you get a bunch of people around the table looking at a document, you always tune the wording. It, you find ways of saying the same thing in a better in a better way, even if it's the same people in the room. It's, it's the fact that it's a new occasion that uh, makes that possible. And wherever possible, simplify. So we worked for some time on SCI version 2, and that was finally published at the end of May in 2017. And the link to the, uh, the paper is uh, via the WISE website under WISE slash SCI. Jeanette, can I check how is the audio now? Is it, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, you sound really, really good now. Uh, must have just been a hiccup. Yeah, okay, the, the weather's really nice outside here in Toulouse in France, so maybe things have improved with the network. So here's the picture of the SCI version two paper. Um, you see there the list of, uh, list of authors, and if you look at the paper, you'd find uh, where they all come from you may recognize some friends and colleagues in there. So what does the SCI version two do? It lays out a series of numbered requirements in five areas, operational security, instant response, traceability, participant responsibilities, and data protection, that each infrastructure should address as part of promoting trust between infrastructures. And I've got now a number of slides where I show some examples of the text, but I think it would be terribly boring to go through all of that. I'll, I'll leave the slides in the, uh, in the deck that will be available to you. Um, and we can go through and you get some idea of the, uh, the flavor. So first of all, there's a glossary, which is I put in, because we had to define terms like participants, so a participant in the, in the infrastructure is an entity providing, using, managing, operating, supporting, or coordinating one or more services. But in particular, the word using, um, because it includes the, the users and the user communities. Um, the user, the individual, is either an individual or, or an organization authorized to access and use services. And then we've always struggled a bit with the, the definition of a term for what is a collection or a group of users. In the old grid days, we used to call it a virtual organization. You might call it community. You might call it um, a project. You might call it you know, the, a project with a PI will get some allocation on a supercomputer. Um, what we come, came up with here in the SCI version two is a collection of users which is a group of users organized with a common purpose and jointly granted access to the infrastructure. And importantly, that may act as the, as the interface between the individual users and the infrastructure. So there's no negotiation or agreement directly between the individual user and the infrastructure services they're using. It's, it's done for them by this proxy of the, their grouping or their collection. And here is the sort of text that you see in SCI version two. So here's the, the section on instant response. And again, I won't read out the words here, but the four to summarize, one is that you need a process to maintain security contact information. If you're going to handle an instant, it's very important that you need to be able to uh, know who all the various uh, service operators are and who the, the security contacts are for the community, etc. You need a documented instant response procedure. It addresses various roles, but you'll notice that none of this is very prescriptive about exactly what you need to do. And I think that's deliberately part of the SCI. We don't want to sort of dictate to individual infrastructures exactly what they do. It's more of these are the areas that should be addressed. And we can always come back to that in a later version if we want to, but it is deliberately left kind of vague at the moment. So requirement three is the capability to collaborate in handling security instance with uh, 
service providers, communities, and importantly, with other infrastructures. And then you need processes to ensure the regular testing of this capability to make sure that, that the communication still works, that we have the correct uh, communication endpoints. And then four, policies and procedures to ensure compliance with information sharing restrictions. You want to, as an infrastructure, if I'm going to share my instant response secret stuff with you, I want to be sure that you're going to handle it um, with the same uh, privacy and uh, protection mechanisms that I would expect um, of, of ourselves. Right, so it will only be shared with other security teams and not redistributed further without prior approval, etc. So that's instant response. There's an important one then on uh, section five on traceability, traceability of service usage, the answering the basic questions: who, what, where, when, and how. This is um, vital to fully understanding the details of any security incident. Um, these logs can only be kept for a certain time, so you need a specification of the retention, and that has to be consistent with local, national, and international regulations, etc. And a specification of the controls that a service provider implements to achieve the goals of, of number one. And then there are some participant responsibilities, and here I, I remind you this included users. So for collections of users, each infrastructure has three requirements to make sure that the collection of users are aware of and agree to abide by various infrastructure, infrastructure policy requirements, including the ability to, to handle security instance. Um, there needs to be appropriate control of the management of the membership registration system for individual users, including registration, renewal, suspension, etc. Um, must address the validation of accuracy of contact information on a periodic renewal as well. Um, and the process to inform collection of users uh, that you are held responsible for actions of each individual member of the collection. And if individual members of the collection misbehave, it may actually affect the collection as a whole in their use of the infrastructure um, services. And then likewise, we have some requirements on the collection of users themselves, um, a process to identify user responsible for an action, appropriate logs of the membership management, the registration, and uh, a mechanism of defining their common aims and purposes and making it available to the infrastructure to allow them to make decisions on resource allocation. So that was the SCI paper. Um, I don't want to go through it in any more detail, um, but obviously at the end, happy to uh, answer questions. One thing which is contained within the, uh, in the, in the document is we've defined a four level maturity um, schema to actually allow infrastructures or auditors indeed to actually do some assessment of maturity. So for each of the numbered um, requirements, you can actually, as an infrastructure, assess, declare your maturity on these four levels, where zero means you haven't even implemented the function. Um, level one means you've, you've implemented it, but it's um, not documented. Level two is the same, but, but is now comprehensively documented. And level three is the... Uh, the, the, the top assurance of being reviewed by an independent external body rather than just self-assessment. And what we came up with in version one was a, a spider diagram showing the concentric circles of the, these levels, zero, one, two, and three. And then for each of the uh, requirements, you could actually draw this blue line that shows how you, uh, um, how you meet the, uh, the assessment. And this could then be useful between two, two infrastructures could share this information with each other and decide whether this is sufficient for them to, to trust on any particular topic. Having done this, it is, I must admit, something that we haven't taken that much further forward yet. It's always on our plan to do, but uh, I'll comment on that again in the future, uh, in a while. So in June 2017, the publication 
coincided um, with the networking conference TNC 17 in Linz in Austria. And we went um, for an endorsement by our infrastructures. And so this statement, infrastructures endorse the governing principles and approach of SCI. Again, I won't read out all the words, um, but facilitating exchange of security information and that the present activities by the research and the infrastructures should be continued and reinforced. And we managed to get, um, we were very grateful to get endorsement by a large number of uh, infrastructures that you see in the list there from EGI through to the Human Brain Project. And there's a, um, a giant press release that was done on the day and the, the little photograph is the signing ceremony that we had in, in Linz on that day. So this was the, the closest we came to actually full endorsement by the management. I mean, all of the, the people in the working group are working for various um, um, infrastructures, but here with this endorsement, we actually got the endorsement by the management of our infrastructures that uh, we were doing things which were useful and uh, should continue. So that's really SCI version two. And then for the rest of the webinar, I want to, uh, to, to briefly cover what we've been doing in the last year since the publication of STI version two, year on a bit. So I've got some slides now on current SCI activities. And there are four things here. One which is work in progress, and this is um, joint work on policy development kits, SCI compliant or sanctify compliant policy development kits, and in particular, um, work towards a new baseline acceptable use policy. And I think it's worth pointing out here that both of these activities have been extremely well supported by the ARC2 project um, and uh, the policy development team therein. I've got some of the colleagues sitting around the, the table here with me in uh, Toulouse at the moment. And the things on the to-do list are producing FAQs, guidelines, and training. How do we satisfy SCI version 2? What about doing more maturity assessments from number of infrastructures? And the problem here is that being a volunteer activity, that th these are areas where we don't have explicit project funding with um, milestones and deliverables, whereas the ARC2 work is, is A, funded, and B, is part of a project plan. So... It just shows you how the advantage of having uh, properly funded activities, as nice as the, uh, the volunteer collaboration is, it's, um, it's always good to actually have some, some funding which concentrates the mind. So what I'm gonna show here now is um, the first two activities, the policy development kits, and these are some slides which uh, my colleague Urosh Devanovic from KIT showed in the WISE meeting in, uh, in August in Alexandria on the policy development kit. And then afterwards, I'll move to the acceptable use policy um, slides. So here, what's the idea of the policy development kit? Well, it's taking into account that establishing any infrastructure or community requires clear rules for security, membership management, data protection, etc. Rules imply that one of the nice ways of doing rules is via policies. Policies of providing trust, managing and governing your infrastructure and can be used, of, of course, for legal compliance where that's necessary. And so ARC2 project, um, as part of WISE, intends to provide templates, instructions and training. Um, this is still work in progress. The drafts are not yet finalized, but there's a link here to the ARC wiki where all the details about the policy, policy development kit um, may be found. And we welcome... Uh, comments and feedback on that. So the team asked itself which policies, and clearly there's the SCI trust framework as you've just heard about. Um, there's the Sanctify one for the uh, community trust framework where you've actually got a research community involved. And also the desire to take on board current best practices from lots of places, um, EGI, CERN, the Biomedical Elixir, Trusted CI, of course, uh, you guys in the, in the US. Um, the policies have started from the EGI versions, but are based to meet the requirements of Sanctify because that's the, 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 the thrust of ARC being 
federated identity for research communities. It's, it's more aimed at policies that research communities would need. And so therefore, some other policies, which may be infrastructure specific, will need to be uh, added later or handled separately, perhaps by WISE or and the EOSC hub project. And again, I've now got a number of slides that Aura showed in August. Um, I won't go through them in detail. They're there for, for reference. You can also find them on the wiki. So first of all, there's a top level infrastructure policy set into various areas. Um, that gives overall um, authority to the sub policies and regulates the activities. Um, again, this was based on the EGI top level policy document as a starting point. Membership management, I've already referred to that in several of the slides before. This is an important aspect of the, uh, the community who after all is charged now by the infrastructure to take care of the user registration and membership management. And so there are policy documents describing what we expect of that process and how things should be done. Data protection, of course, and traceability are always come up as being important uh, topics. There's one on acceptable authentication assurance policy. Um, there's a lot of recent work, both in RefEDs and elsewhere, and also in ARC and in IGTF about various different assurance profiles and defining what is acceptable for or required for a particular research community or particular infrastructure is important. So there's a policy that defines some of the issues there, how to actually define which are the approved authentication sources. Data protection, there's been a lot of interest in the, uh, the new EU gen GDPR, G uh, General Data Protection, uh, regulation that came into force of May of this year and obviously everybody needs a privacy um, notice and privacy policy and they, and again here's a a template which enables a research community to actually um, define their own privacy policy. Instant response procedure is required by SCI as you saw. Uh, this again is something which you don't want a new research community to have to to reinvent, so giving them some template of the ideas of the things they should do um, makes great sense. And so having, having this template as part of the policy development kit would be very useful. So that's the policy development kit in general. One aspect of that is the acceptable use policy. And here I'm showing some slides from another colleague of mine sitting here in the room, Ian Nielsen, from, also from STFC, um, again with some work which was uh, um, Funded by him, for, uh, funded for him by ARC2, but it was also discussed with EGI and EU DAT and WLCG. So I've put a EOSC hub logo on this as well. So what is the motivation for a common AUP? Um, it's to to make a recommendation for the context of an acceptable use policy to act as a baseline policy or template for adoption by research communities. And having a common one facilitates a more rapid community infrastructure bootstrap, eases the trust of users across and between infrastructures, provides a consistent and more understandable, understandable enrollment process for users. And came to the conclusion that the adoption of a policy is preferred to actually providing people with a template that they, uh, they compete. This is one of the areas where the same set of common words is a great benefit. So what Ian did earlier this year was a detailed analysis of AUPs from 11 different infrastructures. The links to the details of that are provided on the slide and even considered a full clause by clause um, comparison in a spreadsheet of the various uh, components of the AUP. And this was a very useful starting point then to actually um, uh, create the new baseline. So we had a joint face-to-face -face meeting at, held at CERN in July of this year between a large number of different stakeholders, EOSC Hub, ARC2, EGI, EU DAT, and WRCG. And we spent the best part of three days thrashing, thrashing out. We kept coming back to it, an agreed draft set of policy points um, with the understanding at the end of all of that, that actually the wise 
publishing this as part of WISE and the SCI Working Group would be a good way of um, sharing this with the worldwide community. It was presented and discussed at the WISE uh, workshop in the uh, August NSF Cybersecurity Summit. And we had some very useful discussion there and feedback and input. And we're still working on this WISE, WISE baseline AUP. Um, there's a link here to all of the, uh, the details on that. And we still welcome comments and suggestions onto the, uh, um, the, uh, the actual words of the baseline AUP. Uh, we will then need to, to consult more widely with uh, various stakeholders around the world. But uh, anybody listening to the, uh, the webinar today would be very welcome to, to look at that and uh, provide some comments. So how will this baseline AUP be used? Um, it forms part of the information shown to a user during registration with the community, um, provides expectations on behavior and specifies various restrictions. The baseline text can then optionally be augmented with additional community specific or infrastructure specific clauses as required, but we would like the numbered clauses, the baseline not to be changed. Um, this is different from the AUP we had before, where the AUP was quite frequently changed. And the registration point where the users presented with the AUP may then, um, is where they see the AUP. It can be operated directly by the user's research community or by a third party running the service on the community's behalf. Other information shown during that registration process needs to include a um, Privacy notice to meet the requirements of data protection regulations, information about the processing, the personal data together with their rights under law regarding this processing. It can also have service level agreements, information about what the user can expect from the service in terms of quality, reliability, availability, etc., and any other optional terms of service that need to be specified. So that, I'm just about done here. Um, what I did promise that I would uh, perhaps propose was some areas where, given that I think many of us have recognized and it came up during the discussions in the NSF um, summit in August, that quite a few of the areas that WISE is working on and that Trusted CI as a, um, an entity is working on overlap. And so to what extent and how can we best um, work together if we decide or collaborate. And so I've just written down here some proposals which we could discuss um, either now or in the future. I mean, one obvious statement is that the, uh, the individuals who are part of the trusted CI uh, enterprise uh, are very welcome to, as any, anybody else is, it's an open organization to join, join WISE, join the working groups and buy, buy that membership to help and influence things. Um, I think we should acknowledge that there are possible different scopes. WISE and SCI is very much limited to these infrastructures that we've talked about. Um, I imagine that Trusted CI, and I think that's true, has a broader scope where um, some of the large facilities are not necessarily classified as, an, as a cyber infrastructure as such, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, our infrastructures tend to include multiple management domains. There may be other infrastructures where they're under a single man management domain. Um, not sure. Um, but there's no reason why we should be doing exactly the same thing if we've got different scopes. Possible topics we could discuss, comparing the template policies, um, what is missing on either side, and then we can learn from each other and uh, find things that we just have, have forgotten to think about. Um, comments and input to the new WISE baseline AUP are very welcome, as I said. Um, maybe ideas of how to do self-assessments or audits of SCI maturity as well is another topic would be interesting to explore. Um, so I'm just about done. I've got the usual slide of acknowledgement. Certainly uh, thanks to colleagues Urosh and Ian for use of their slides. Um, I'd like to also personally thank all the colleagues in WISE and SCI over many, many years, um, especially my co-chair of the SCI Working Group, Adam, Adam Slagle, um, NCSA now moved to ESNet, and the various co-authors of SCI version 1 and version 2. Um, we, of course, acknowledge funding received from various uh, the European Commission Horizon 2020 projects, 
especially Arc2 and EOS Cub, but many projects in the past. All of our infrastructures have, uh, have funded in various ways, providing people and giving people time and travel money to, to do things. And um, acknowledging that uh, Exceed, that's been a very uh, active uh, member of this, uh, of the WISE community, is supported by the National Science Foundation. And I think with that, I'll say thank you for your attention and um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions or we can have some discussion. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to give the audience some time to type in questions. And while they are doing that, I'm going to just grab the screen real quick and show some stuff for coming up for Trusted CI. Uh, so please take our survey. Let me just pop the link here into the chat. Uh, we, we read the survey because we appreciate your feedback, but we also like to know if there's any topics that you would like to, uh, for us to present on uh, in our webinar series or if you would like to offer to present. So please take the survey and give us your feedback. And then um, we are still uh, have an open window for engagement applications. And so I just wanted to put that out there. I know we're running out of time this month, but there's still enough time. October 1st, 2018 is our deadline. Uh, so if you would like to apply for an engagement with Trusted CI, the, uh, go to that uh, website and you can learn more about what an engagement includes. Uh, if it's something that your project would be interested in pursuing, please let us know. And uh, next month, our next webinar is October 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And the topic is a workflow centric approach to reproducibility and data integrity. And it's by Jeff Spees. He was a, a keynote speaker, I think two years ago at our summit. And his presentation left a great impression on the attendees. And so I asked him to present uh, next month. And so I'm, we're all looking forward to that presentation. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing so I can go back to see the chat screen here. Um, do we have any more, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Susan says, thanks for the talk, David. Okay, you're welcome, Susan, <laughs> that you could join. Okay, I think, I think our, I think we're, we're, uh, we've got all the feedback from the audience right now. So, um, David, Dave, if you have any other uh, comments, do you know uh, when the next time you'll be meeting with Trusted CI is? Is that going to be just next year at the summit or will it be earlier than that? Uh, well, I mean, why is as a community will meet again? We're talking in the steering committee um, about a meeting in February or March or perhaps April. Yeah, and um, I saw in the in your or in photo, Europe, right? That will right. be in Europe. And I saw in your photo, uh, Adam was in the photo from the earlier this year. Yeah, so. that photo it was interesting because that photo was just before the snow fell. <laughs> and <laughs> Adam's probably used to snow, but I don't think he's used to British snow, right? This is. <laughs> um, some of the people's traveling away from the meeting was affected by the snow in, in New England. Yeah, around but, I mean, here in the Midwest. Very well to come to the European meeting. As, as regards the next North American, I mean, we're always open to ideas. There's a number of uh, North Americans on the steering committee. And, you know, we sometimes think about other conferences. I mean, the first time we met at the Exceed meeting, that the, the series it's now called PERC, um, I think it's particularly worked really well at the Cybersecurity Summit. You've been kind enough to invite us and it's been very productive because we get the right people there. And that's how, but, so whether we do the same again next year, I don't know, that's, that's partly up to you, partly uh, up to the steering committee. If other people ha have ideas or want to uh, offer to host us, we're very welcome getting together. We're, we're constantly discussing whether it's best to have it tied to another event or to have a standalone meeting. And there are pros and cons. Yep, absolutely. And Very so sometimes we do, a, we do a mix, right? You know, sometimes it's good to be at a meeting, but sometimes it's good to have a standalone thing. 
Right, because then you don't feel like you're stealing attention away from some other presentation that's going on in parallel. Indeed, yeah. Or, or ha people having to stay longer or come earlier, you know. Right. We extend in time. Okay, well, I, th I think we've got, I think you've just covered everything so well. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, 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 Mark says very informative talk. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Mark, for saying that. Um, so I think we're going to uh, wrap things up here. And David, I just wanted to thank you so much for presenting to our community. And this presentation will be available online uh, later on today or maybe tomorrow. And and I'm going to get uh, Dave's slides and I'll I'll post those as well. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for. Uh, attending this webinar and thank you Dave for presenting. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Oh, okay. And uh, with that, I will stop recording. <laughs>